Welcome back to Q on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and from PRI, Public Radio International. I'm wannabe Canadian Kevin Smith, and I'm in Los Angeles. Quick note for those of you listening in beautiful Halifax, Nova Scotia, man, I'm, I'm coming to town. I'll be there March 22nd to screen uh, the movie Nobody Saw, Tusk, followed by a little thing I like to call An Evening with Kevin Smith, which is exactly as disappointing as you might imagine. Just ask my wife. That's at the Spats Theater in Halifax, March 22nd. Come on and see, uh, see me if you're so inclined. Tickets at csmod.com. Uh, All right, folks, this one's uh, very personal for me because I love this person. She's an absolute hero to me. Uh, To anyone who's been creative and anyone who tries to tell stories as entertainingly but as authentically as possible. For three decades, the Canadian, that's three decades, the Canadian teen drama Degrassi. That's right. You know, I'm talking, I would not be on cue and not be talking about Degrassi. Degrassi has tackled some of the toughest parts of the adolescent experience abortion, date rape, cyber stalking gay bashing, transgender, and sometimes these kids actually go to class, ladies and gentlemen. There's nothing the show shies away from, and that combination of boldness and sincerity is part of the reason why it's played a major role in shaping the way teens are portrayed on television around the world. Every current teen show owes a debt of gratitude to this 35-year-old show, and in terms of reaching around the world, the classic Degrassi, Degrassi Junior High, Degrassi High, reached a butterball little kid from New Jersey at one point and became one of his favorite programs, so much so that he pursued a berth on the show. That's right. I got to act on Degrassi. I've been on Degrassi. This is proof. Listen, this is me talking to Paige Michael Chuck. Listen. Mr. Smith? As I live and breathe, Paige Michaelton. How are you? Um, Michael Chuck. Michael Chuck, you know what? My bad. We just always called you the busted leg girl, so. Not anymore. These will be the least brokenest gams on your red carpet. I'm sorry, did you just say gams? What 21st century teenager still uses the term gams? Uh, the kind who needs one more ticket to the premiere tonight. Could you spare a teensy weensy extra golden ticket, Mr. Smith, please, for my friend? I happen to have one of those teensy weensy tickets right here, and it could be yours if you say about. A boot. Mm. I melt. That's just so cute. You earn this. I've been telling that a boot joke for decades now, and that came from my love for the entire Degrassi franchise. The series marks its 35th anniversary this year. 35 years. And joining me now is Degrassi's co-creator and Canadian genius, I'll say it, Linda Schuyler. This week, Linda and Degrassi are being recognized at the 2015 Canadian Screen Awards. And right now, without further ado, Linda Schuyler. Hey, Linda! Hey, Mr. Smith. How lovely to hear your voice. Mr. Smith is my father, please. I don't even call you Ms. Schuyler anymore, for heaven's sakes. 35 years, you Canadian genius. Let's talk about this. Um, Did you ever think, number one, that I'd be sitting here talking to you? You know, you make it 35 years in your career. You imagine they let you sit down with Barbara Walters. Instead, you got to talk to Silent Bob. Oh, Kevin, it is my pleasure to talk to you. And if you'll recall, do you remember that day we were in the Paramount lot and we were going in, we were pitching a feature and the driver, you were driving your black SUV and the driver said, oh, yes, uh, Mr. Smith, um, you know, Miss Schuyler, uh, yes, driver, you can proceed. And I thought, yes, Mr. Smith is my driver on the Paramount lot. So (laughs) not only can you be my driver, you can be my interviewer. And I am thrilled. It was always my privilege to get behind the wheel uh, with you in the car. I drove extra (laughs) careful because I knew I had the heritage of Canada uh, riding with me. Let's talk about the show that you co-created and has lasted in in many incarnations. When they say 35 years, does that begin with the kids of Degrassi Street? Yes. The the kids of Degrassi Street went on air in... Yeah, 1980. Um, And in those days, we were doing, you know, two or three episodes a year. It's not like it's been continuous 35 years of um, nonstop heavy volume production, not at all. But um, it has been 35 years. Um, We did... We did the kids of Degrassi Street, and then we did Degrassi Junior High and Degrassi High, which is where you picked us up on PBS. Oh, yes. We were with WGBH. Where um, apparently it was produced up there for, uh, uh, by you guys, but it played in schools. Like Ben Affleck, when we were on 
uh, I think Mallrats was like, right. oh, I know that show. I've talked about, have you ever seen this genius show out of Canada, Grassy? It's like a way better 90210 with less music. And uh, <laughs> he was like, he said, yeah, man, they used to make us watch that in school. I was like, I wish they'd made us watch this in school. So for him, it was part of a school curriculum. Well, you know, he's not alone because we were a big part of the school curriculum. And, it, you know, let's remember back, we're talking the 1980s and early 90s. There was not the, the internet. There was not a lot of places that young people could go and find information about this very tumultuous time in their lives when they're stepping out of childhood, stepping into adulthood, and all those physical, sexual, emotional changes that are happening. So when we were doing the um, classic show, we really had a double mandate. We were, we were definitely wanting to entertain because you have to entertain first, but we had a large educational mandate because it was really relatively few other places that, that were safe that these kids could go to get their information. And, and as a result, we ended up being on the curriculum of many, many um, family studies and health programs across the country. And this is a show, by the time I discovered, it had been on the air for quite some time, and it was already ahead of its time. I remember sitting in the very same quick stop uh, where we made clerks, me and Jason Muse on Sunday after making the morning newspapers, kicking back, and we didn't have cable. We just had, you know, the basic channels. And so mm -hmm. on PBS, here was a power hour of Degrassi Junior High and Degrassi High. And the first episode we tuned in on, I've, I've talked about many times, like we sat there making fun of, who are these kids with their dopey accents? Then all of a sudden, one of the kids starts talking about being pregnant, and we shut up quick. We were like, wow, like, wh what show is this? Leaning forwards in our chair, because because you didn't hear that normally on American programming. Teen pregnancy wasn't handled that much. You guys kind of cracked the barrier with that and then kind of um, continued in existence that kind of like how Law & Order does, uh, ripped from the headlines. You guys always took your storylines from what was happening in the world right from the jump. Whose idea was it to be like, let's tackle uh, teen pregnancy with Spike? Well, um, that'll be mine. Um, and I came at it from two ways, Kevin. One, I had spent the previous eight years of my life as a junior high school teacher. So um, I was very aware of the issues that were facing kids. And we also had a teen pregnancy in my family that in those days, the way you dealt with it was by sending somebody off to a home for unwed mothers and hopefully the teachers and students wouldn't miss them at school. And so all my mother as well. My mother had the exact same thing happen to her and that, when she was born. That is so wrong. And um, so we wanted to, to sort of tackle these issues head on. And one of the things I was really proud about that we did in the early days, and we continue to do, if we had a storyline, say the Spike line where Spike became pregnant, we didn't handle it like an after school special whereby in an hour she gets pregnant and she's either sent away or has an abortion. Well, she wouldn't have had an abortion in those days, but um, you, the story would have been wrapped up. We always do our storylines, our key issues with major characters in the show so that we get to see them week after week, not necessarily in a storyline about themselves, but they'll be in maybe a B story or a C story so that, you know, if they've become pregnant or let's say they have AIDS or there's, you know, a a mental illness, we get to see it throughout the weeks, but not necessarily as the issue, just how they're interacting with other kids as well, which was a really important part of um, establishing the whole um, storytelling techniques of our show. I mean, it's kind of like a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. You're actually imparting wisdom. What could be considered by some without the entertainment value is like now I'm being lectured by an adult. But it's never felt like that. The show has always felt like it was written by the audience that it's presented to. Now, how do you pull together... In the beginning, it was you and Kit and Jan. How do you pull together a staff like that for future incarnations, like Next Generation? Well, the... the, the, the the, the trick is we have to try and keep our voice authentic. Like a lot of people use the word realistic, which I shy away from, particularly with so much reality television and, and whatnot. So, but what we are aiming for is the authenticity of, of emotions and of experience. One of the ways which I think is critical to achieving that is we always cast age appropriate. And I, I, I often talk about the fact, you know, it's very easy to find a 25-year-old who looks 15 who could play the part. Um, and it would be much easier for union regulations and, and number of hours worked and all that to actually go that route. But 
that 25-year-old also brings with them another 10 years' worth of life experience. So when you cast a 15-year-old to play a 15-year-old, they're only bringing that much life experience. Not only is it entertaining and, and, and enlightening, the show to me has always been inspiring. From the moment I found it on PBS, later on in my career, I remember watching The Next Generation. And at first, I shied away from it because I was a big fan of the classic Degrassi. And I said, why would they go back and mess with something that was so perfect? You can't do that nowadays. And I didn't watch for a few episodes in and next into The Next Generation run. When I finally did... I was like, oh, my Lord, they found a way to go back to, to the source material and, and make it completely fresh. And as much as that same storyline we were talking about, the pregnant teenager Spike, um, spawns the next generation show by, you know, her daughter Emma being the focus or the beginning of the focus of Degrassi the Next Generation. Suddenly you've got a universe that you're playing in and it's all tied together. And I remember falling in love deeply in love with that show that's when i reached out to you and was like please i want to do this because you were tackling just like in the original classic version you tackled topics that were huge you know like i remember watching the the episode about the armbands for oral and stuff like that and i just read about that in like the daily news of new york times i was man it's they i can't believe they've already done an episode about it in terms of all the episodes that have you know some have deemed controversial some have deemed enlightening uh always kind of groundbreaking has there ever been a moment where you're like mm, we can't you know the, on the end here in the states with air degrassi the slow the slogan is it goes there has there ever been a degrassi script where you're like i can't go there not yet um I think the biggest issue that we had where we faced that was wanting to st tell a transgender story. And it was on our whiteboards for a number of years. Because every year at the beginning of a season, we say, what are the issues we want to do? What are the characters we're, we want to um, play with? And it wasn't until season 10 that we actually found a story way in and a character way in that we could tell that story. And we actually met the character once they had transitioned, she was a, a female to male transgender, and we met first the character as Adam, and then later found out that transitioning was going on. And that we had wanted to tell that story for a number of years. And it was very fascinating because when we, we actually won a Peabody for those episodes, and mm. I loved the citation that they gave us because what they said was that we neither sensationalized nor minimalized the storyline. And that is exactly where we want to be with our storytelling. You know, you mentioned that we go rip from the headlines. We do, but we're not doing that to be sensational. We're not doing that for ratings. We're doing that because that's what the kids are experiencing. Now, in an episode like the, or, or dealing with the transgender issue uh, in, in the episodes of Degrassi that you have, uh, you get cited for a Peabody. Amazing. There's got to be some people out there that are not ready for this. Do you get a lot of blowback for these episodes where you push the envelope? Do you, do you get negativity back as well? Funnily enough, on both series, the classic series and The Next Generation, the, two, the one storyline told in two different ways that we've got the most pushback on has been the abortion episodes. Um, right. the, it's the only show on PBS where they actually asked us to change the ending. Um, wow. And on Teen Nick... They weren't able to, when we first ran it, they, when, when we first produced it, they said, I don't know if we can run this. And to their credit, they, they sort of kept it around. It stayed on their radar. And they ended up running that story and two others in that storyline that were from another season back to back. And then they had a panel of experts talk about it. But it took two or three years before they were able to actually feel comfortable airing that storyline. Um, the, 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 you, you have a, a wonderful team that you work with. And I've, I've, since I've been up there and been on a few shows, uh, you know, I've, I've gotten involved in, in the Skylar world beyond just the programming <laughs> of Degrassi itself. You get to work with your man all the time, Steven, correct? 
oh my gosh, how lucky am I? <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's <laughs> and this is something not a lot of people talk about, but like a strong marriage or where the people actually like one another while they work together and you work together 24 seven. Can you talk a little bit about that? Cause he's the unsung hero to me of Degrassi, the next generation, the Degrassi revitalization. Cause he seemed to put a lot of new fuel in your tank and then suddenly boom, Degrassi was back in a big bad way and is an empire now. So a little moment for Steven. If you <laughs> well, honestly, Steven has such um, an incredible mind and it has, is so able to adapt to all the changes that are going on with technology and um, I'm sort of, I'm more your classic storyteller and I tend to go more on a straight narrative. Stephen is the one who right from the get-go um, had us create this amazing um, web presence that was like a virtual school that ran alongside our real school. And it really was um, it was quite revolutionary. There had been no show that launched with that. And we were the first shows to um, come out with webisodes. And Stephen really understood that if we were coming out with the next generation, it wasn't just that we had to tell our story in a linear fashion. We had to really reach the kids where they were at. And um, as a result, We've created so much interesting online material um, and the social media sites that we've got now and the amount of activity that goes on there is all attributed to, to Stephen and, um, you know, his, his love of technology, his love of teenagers, his love of the narrative. Yeah, and, you know, maybe his love for me because it's pretty awesome <laughs> working with your husband. <laughs> Now, let me ask you this, because you brought up the the interactive nature in terms of, like, there's an online audience for the show. You know, people that don't just see it on network, they can pick up the webisodes and continue to follow the world of Degrassi. And you're right, you guys were out in front ahead of everybody uh, doing that. Now, you've watched teenagers change over the 35 years of producing this show. Uh, the teenager in, in the 80s, I, I, while I'm asking you, are, do they resemble the teenager of today? How has, like, social media changed the impact of the show? Do you listen? For the first time ever, you really get to listen to the audience on an immediate basis, and you can change horses in midstream. Do they, do they influence you uh, at any point now? Um, certainly our writers, our producing team, we're very much aware of the discussions going on, on on social media. And, you know, we have podcasts and we we participate in these things. Um, the actual ways of communicating are definitely different. Um, even styles of dating are more different, like they're doing it in groups rather than, you know, so much in a one-on-one -on -one as they used to. But I still maintain that, 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 matters of the heart and, you know, the heart feeling full and joyous and the heart being broken um, and finding out where you fit in on the world because every teenager feels that they're the different one. And one of the things we've tried to reinforce all through our storytelling is that you are not alone, that there are other kids going through this. So, so, I think there is a, a big similarity that connects the teenagers across generations, but there are also big divides in terms of communication and how you actually do get to talk to one another. As you uh, created the show in the beginning, you were thinking, of course, about the audience that you were talking to, a uh, largely Canadian audience or pretty much strictly Canadian audience. When you get into the next generation and suddenly there are co-pro deals with like uh, the uh, network, the, the N in the state or uh, in the states, whatever they're calling it this week. Team Nick. Um, huh? Team Nick. That's right. They changed the name. Um, was, I, was there ever... This is the thing that I want to applaud you for. There was never an effort to, like, once it went more mainstream, like, we got to play down where we're from. Like, suddenly it became very sexy to be this Canadian show. And it, it wasn't like, uh, oh, yeah, by the way, it takes place in Canada. That was a driving factor for the new audience. Um, I, I applaud you for, your, for keeping Canada number one in your, in your heart and mind. Was, that, was there ever a moment where you're like, we got to Americanize? Um, I think we have to thank the Canadian funding system for this. Um, <laughs> it's very You're like, I've been trying to Americanize for 35 years, but Canadian funding won't let me. It's very nice of you to give me so much credit. But, um, you know, Degrassi is a 10 out of 10 show. And for people who don't know what that means is we're, we're financed in such a way by our Canadian broadcaster and by, um, by the government that our show has to be a sort of 100% Canadian. We can have guests 
as we did you, Kevin, mm. very delightfully. Um, but we, we do have to be a Canadian show. And I think, I think the thing that's really worked for us is we're not so... We, yes, we don't hide the fact that it takes place in Toronto. There are streetcars, there are license plates. The money that we exchange is, is Canadian money. But those matters that I was talking about earlier, those matters of the heart, those matters of where do you fit in, those aren't Canadian issues. Those are the issues of youth. Those are the issues of young people searching for their identity as they try to find their independence from their parents and, and become a full rounded adult. And those four or five years when they're in transition, it's so, it's such a common experience all around the world. And that's why I'm, I'm so thrilled to say that we've got fans in Israel and India and Australia. It's and, and we get messages from all of these kids. And, you know, they say, for the first time, somebody, I, I don't feel alone. And nothing could be nicer for me to hear as the producer of the show. Linda, you uh, continue to uh, do Canada proud. You continue to do storytellers proud. And uh, every teacher uh, around the globe owes you a, a continued debt of gratitude, man. You're my hero. Oh, thank you, Kevin. It's been a pleasure. Linda Schuyler, co-creator of the Degrassi franchise, ladies and gentlemen. Degrassi is marking its 35th anniversary this year, and she and the show are being recognized at the Canadian Screen Awards this week. Linda joined us today from Toronto. T-Dot.